is NDTV. And you're watching NDTV Prime. By 2020, which is in just another three years from now, India will be the youngest country in the world. The average age, in fact, in the country will be 29 years, 64% of the population in the working class group. And of course, as more and more youngsters of millennials, they are known, join uh, the workforce. We ask if they're changing work culture in India as we know it. What can we expect in the years, if not decades ahead? Well, joining me, a very special panel, Rohit Vora, Director of Talent Acquisition at uh, IBM, of course, a global technology company, Anis Sarkar, India country lead at Mercer, a global consulting leader in talent and health, along with investments, is with us, as is uh, Professor PVM Rao in Delhi, Professor at IIT uh, Delhi. Let's just uh, get started right away. Rohit, uh, uh, thanks, of course, for waiting so patiently. I know that we've had, we've made you wait uh, for a bit, but I'll start right away. You know, uh, with these vast numbers of young Indians joining the workforce, what is the biggest impact that you are seeing on India's work culture? So, India's work culture uh, is uh, rapidly transforming. Uh, I think uh, technology companies are leading the way, uh, whether they are in the e-commerce space or the core tech space, right? And and we are we are uh, you know uh, are the largest recipients of the uh, millennials, which you call mm -hmm. you can call them the first uh, digital natives. However, I think. Uh, there is a myth about their expectations. I, I think uh, their expectations are not very different mm. from the older generations, right? And and mm -hmm. and they want they want a job where you know they can come perform, they can be themselves, they get regular feedbacks, they get upskilling, and and the organizations help them, you know, to make them succeed. And the older generation expectations were similar. But there are a few fundamental changes, right? Mm -hmm. The fundamental change is uh, from a millennial standpoint, they are focused on the outcome, mm -hmm. right? They, they want uh, uh, their leaders to give them goals, targets, and, mm -hmm. and allow them to achieve in their way, and which mm -hmm you know, nurture and nourish uh, from a creativity standpoint. The so focus not just limited to how they than, work yeah. in their approach, but, but a larger impact on how companies work, how people in earlier, people from earlier generations sort of also react to them. That's interesting. And one of the interesting points, uh, Anish, that uh, Rohit there made was, well, you know, their expectations still pretty much the same. You know, the average age, say, in NDTV is also fell, uh, falling very rapidly. I think that's true of most of our uh, big companies. But, you know, the point that uh, Rohit made that the expectations are the same and what really is that approach you think I mean is there is there sort of a hunger is it the same hunger that say previous generations had are they willing to put themselves out there more and, and most importantly Anish do you believe that they are they're more risk takers their appetite for risk is now perhaps greater than there ever was um, thank you Natasha let me just address the first question I just wanted to add to what Rohit said I think while the basket of factors that you know, uh, keeps an employee, you know, attached or, or wanting to continue or stay on or, or join an organization is the same across generations. Mm -hmm. Our research has shown that uh, millennials very increasingly are looking at a, at, a few, at a few specific sort of aspects of the overall sort of, uh, you know, employee value proposition, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, much more than maybe other generations. So, for example, mm. Uh, the sense of purpose, feeling a pride in the values mm. uh, that, the, that the company has, mm. looking at a, a more of an entrepreneurial culture, mm -hmm. to what extent can they be their own boss, mm -hmm. having an atmosphere, uh, a, a collaborative culture, an atmosphere of trust and fairness, mm. and very, very importantly, work-life balance. Mm. I think more and more people are willing to uh, give up higher salaries, uh, maybe give up higher positions for a right. better work-life balance. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what we're seeing in millennials, mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Okay. Uh, to the yeah. Okay, Sorry. Professor Rao, I'll just come to you in just a bit. But Rohit, if I could just come back to you know the, the point that uh, Ani is making that you know their approach in many ways perhaps different. We are now 
talking about a work life balance it is becoming quite mainstream and it's starting quite young you don't have to wait till you're 45 50 and then realize that i need a work life balance but you know this is perhaps a generation that's more open to it knows what's out there and the point that anish is making would you agree with that that sort of willing it's not just about the money anymore yeah it's not about the money of course i i i think uh, money is a necessity uh, mm -hmm. Uh, in any environment but at the same time it's not only about the money work life uh, uh, balance is crucial people have hobbies there is a culture of now I want to go to the gym I want to exercise mm -hmm. right I, I think the earlier generation it was all work 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 and I and I think people realize that you know healthier bodies and healthier minds mm -hmm. and, and the creativity is better the outcomes are better the output is better mm -hmm. it's better quality mm -hmm. right so the whole harmony, I think people realize that uh, and in the younger generations uh, between the body and the mind. And perhaps that's why, uh, Professor Rao, that we are seeing, you know, surveys like we've seen this uh, uh, rant and work monitor survey, which says that 83% of the Indian workforce says that they would love to be entrepreneurs. Many of them from institutions like yours, of course, the IITs. And again, coming back to the fact that individual is willing to take risks, not just about the money, but putting themselves out there and perhaps large numbers of them wanting to make real change as well. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, when we look at the present generation of students mm. and if you look at the entrepreneurial graph, mm. uh, it's like exponentially rising. Mm. Uh, I think there are a number of parameters now mm. to say why it's happening. Mm. We see that at IIT Delhi and other IITs mm. and it's even happening uh, at uh, other institutes mm. including uh, s tier 2 and tier 3 cities. Mm. So, uh, so, I think probably as it was said, that uh, the present generation of students are more risk taking uh, mm -hmm. that's one thing mm -hmm. and uh, another thing is uh, they also have a role models now right uh, absolutely uh, and uh, third is uh, many of the institutes like iits mm. have established themselves as a brand mm. and that gives some kind of a security mm. even in case if you fail in your entrepreneurial mm. ventures you always mm. have this brand to sail on absolutely so so there are a number of uh, and i think also when we look at a uh, lot of the government ecosystem, hmm. it's also like very pro millennials. Mm -hmm. uh, and Absolutely. I think all these things probably. I think we recognize are we are a young country. Yeah, exactly. Sort of we we yeah. need to sort of take yeah. them yeah. along and have our policies on them. Well, I'm also told that I'm now joined by Hari Krishna Reddy, the CEO and uh, a CEO and founder of Param AI and Artificial Intelligence platform uh, for recruiters. If you could just come in on the point that Professor Rao was just making, you know, the, the, the point that there seems to have been a mind shift a change. You know, we were talking about turning entrepreneur, but also putting failure on the table. Failure is no longer a bad word. Perhaps one generation ago, you know, if you got pink slip, you couldn't talk about it, you hate it, you were not comfortable with it. But now companies start, they fold up, people right. move on, and it's, it's not really held against them. In fact, very often, uh, you know, we've had top founders who've told us that failure is a good thing because it teaches them it you know all that they ought to do and more importantly not do you are right so I was uh, following the conversation um, that the landscape has changed now there are people who are ready to take the risk uh, people doesn't have fear of failure hmm. not only the new generation uh, the, the the generation who has spent about 10 to 12 years in the corporate career mm -hmm. now they are looking at the entrepreneurship as a you know different career altogether right, right. so so I think the overall, if you look at the market, the people have really ready to uh, experiment, move out of comfort zone, mm -hmm. and uh, they are not worried about a failure. The only okay. thing is they need to fail fast because they need to learn fast and then uh, rebuild their career kind of thing. But yes, so people inclination towards entrepreneurship is absolutely growing and it's a really good sign. And that's one sign, sign of how um, the approach you know, that from millennials a, from have. A perspective and startup ecosystem. Okay. Anish, yeah. you wanted to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would go a step further. I think failure is a badge of honor on an entrepreneur's resume. I mm. think uh, more and more people want to know what you've learned from your failures and people who never failed, I think, uh, mm. seem too good to be true. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted mm. to bring in another point here on, on the point on risk taking. Mm -hmm. I think in addition to a lot of people wanting to be entrepreneurs or joining startups, mm -hmm. I think the gig economy, as they call it, which is already fairly strong and rising in, in uh, the US and other mature economies is really in, in our experience and research picking up in India as well. Mm. I think more and more people are happy to, to freelance or do uh, work on a temporary or a part-time mm. basis mm. or on a project basis because it gives them the balance they need. And uh, you know, in the early days, we'd all be worried if you did have a full-time job. Absolutely. Uh, but I think people are more confident now and they feel 
uh, doing things part time or on mm -hmm. a project basis gives them that much mm -hmm. more flexibility in mm -hmm. their lives. Mm -hmm. There's just so many options there uh, on the table. If I could just go back to you, uh, Rohit, very quickly, why do you believe sort of that is happening? You know, the, the, the fact that uh, suddenly failure is sort of more accepted. I, I remember a couple of years ago being told that startup founders, uh, you know, had trouble getting married because most people didn't want to marry their uh, girls, especially mm -hmm. off to founders, you know, saying that you have no job security, where are you going to go? You're going to end up as, as, as failure. But there seems to have been a mind shift across generations. Isn't that true? It is true and I think there is more acceptance around failure but mm. you know we got to be all practical about it. It sure. all looks great, sounds mm. good you know uh, on the books and, and, and but I think when you fail it's always advisable to fail small, try small and just grow into it because mm. once you fail big mm -hmm. you've seen so many youngsters really take them down for the long term and they lose probably 8-10 years of their life, 12 mm -hmm. years of their life. So I would just you know say fair enough take baby steps fail mm -hmm. fail small mm -hmm. you know and then because once you big because it's a big jolt on an individual's Absolutely. life and like I said it's all about the individual if you lost mm -hmm. you know time between your 21 22 to 35 just trying to recover from a big failure mm -hmm. it can really b bog you down so you got to be practical about it absolutely so you, you know, I, you're I, I take the point that you're making it's, it's, it's okay to accept it but perhaps not romanticize it in the way that it often is and you know the kind of blogs that we we read we sort of Fair enough. You know, the cynics could argue, Professor Rao, that, you know, while we talk about millennials and we talk about the changing work culture, we are talking about a tiny percentage of India, basically those who have these opportunities, wherever, whichever part of the country they may be from, but opportunities only in India's big cities, not in large parts of the country. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I, th I think uh, that's largely true, but I think the scene is changing very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at uh, particularly now the tier 2 and tier 3 cities mm. are fast catching up. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, particularly the students who graduate from these institutes, mm. they, they're also finding opportunities in their own hometowns mm -hmm. and trying to do startup. Mm -hmm. And uh, even for example, the social innovation mm -hmm. is uh, social entrepreneurship is catching very fast. Mm -hmm. uh, where that's we heartening. Yeah, we, we have cases where uh, students who came from very modest backgrounds and mm. from rural areas mm. going back to their own places and trying to see how to address their own local problems. Mm -hmm. That was, of course, it's still pretty small. Sure. Uh, for a country, the beginning yeah, yeah, for a country like India, mm. but I think we have a huge potential okay. Uh, okay. provided if we take right steps okay. and I think there is a, there's a lot which can happen. Okay. Anish, would you agree the constant criticism of course is that you know we are leaving large parts of the country behind. I mean just look at it when we talk about jobs and where, what the job scenario is in the country, the kind of protests that we've been seeing from different groups, the Marathas that we've seen in Mumbai or, or the Jats that we've seen in Haryana out there on the streets and it all sort of at the end of the day comes down to jobs and they sort of seem to be a large young population that's always involved in these protests again and coming down to jobs and then the big question is that when we talk about millennials again are we leaving a large part of India behind those who are out on the streets looking for these jobs what would you say Anish? In India uh, I mean there's too much of concentration of you know the formal economy in the you know top 10 or 12 or 15 large cities I think uh, yes it is a it is a reality there are millions of young people, millennials out there with probably uh, in the, the tier 2, tier 3 cities or even in the rural areas because as education is <clears throat> catching up, we have many more graduates but you know frankly honestly not enough jobs. Mm. Uh, but I think over the next 5 to 10 years it's quite inevitable mm. just given the infrastructure and the saturation in all our sort of top cities that it is inev inevitable I think that you know the economy will have to shift outwards, mm. it will have to start to cover tier 2, tier 3 cities. Uh, I think hopefully with uh, two or three years of good monsoons, the rural economy gets a boost, there's better income, there's more prosperity. So I, I think it's inevitable that it has to start to flow there. But yes, at the moment, there's still too much of a concentration in mm. the large cities. And I think this is where we need to take a leaf out of the book of China because, you know, China has mm. very successfully created probably, you know, 200 cities which mm. have you know, a populations of a few million and, and, and more, Opportunities which are, were pretty you know, much close to being similar. as prosperous as right. the really big ones. Absolutely. Are we any close to getting it? That's still the big question. But uh, 
Hare Krishna, Reddy, if I could just get you in at this point, you know, the, uh, the uh, other side of the, the challenge really when we look at workforce with millennials is we have this young population that's passing out of our top institutions. But every year we're looking at surveys and some pretty frightening statistics which say that large numbers of them are unemployable for a whole host of reasons, not the right skills or even language can be a big concern. How do you see sort of this in in uh, conjunction with the fact that there are so many of them hungry for the best opportunities and the best uh, opportunities, like I said. So, right, if you uh, look at the companies the way used to, they used to recruit the companies the way they are uh, recruiting now, uh, mm. right? It's, uh, they are looking for more of a, the people who are very fungible, very flexible uh, mm. and, you know, people easily coachable um, mm. and adaption towards learning new technologies, mm. um, pick up things fast and all, right? Mm. So, so, so I, if, I mean, if you look at from an education system perspective, uh, there are not many colleges or an education system who actually have not gone beyond the traditional way of teaching mm. or, um, you know, uh, coaching and educating their uh, students to, mm. to really pick up the new technologies and all. So, I think the research capability, uh, learning about new technologies, uh, you know, getting up to the speed about the market mm. is still not evolved. That's the reason there is a lot of tier 2, tier 3 college students are struggling to figure out a job. Mm. But um, I think the, the, the landscape here also is changing. So, now if you look at the tier 2 cities like Indore, uh, if you look at uh, Cochin, Trivandrum, you know, Warangal. So, there uh, the startup ecosystems okay. are expanding. So, Indore has a very good successful startups, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the startup environment, uh, earlier, about a year back or two years back, only IITs and IIMs, you know, these, mm -hmm. these co-founders used to get funding. But eventually, now if I see the startup ecosystem, mm -hmm. people from tier 2, tier 3 colleges, mm -hmm. tier 2, tier 3 startups, uh, cities, you okay, know, they're also getting know. heavily funded. They okay. are growing fast. Yeah. That's good to know. That's good to know. Professor, that was a point yeah. that you were making so that it's not just, of course, elite institutions. Fast, think, uh, but, but the fact is also that, you know, in focus has been our, uh, what some say, just abysmal spending on education and how that, uh, you know, will really let a country down. And like I said, we want our young today, want the best that's out there, be it education, but access is, is a huge challenge. Yeah, that's true. I think if you look at uh, the access to higher education mm. itself is the number of people who are opting mm. is pretty small compared mm. to many of the cities. Mm. Uh, but I think one of the points which was made was very right. Uh, added to that, I think the changes in curricula mm. is a very, very important, mm. particularly if you want to look at success of millennials in mm. futures. Mm. Uh, there is still, uh, traditionally if you look at, except a few handful of the institutes, uh, most of the, in most of the institutions, the education is still lectures and examination. Mm. Whereas, students are more hungry for team based learning, mm. social learning, mm. uh, lifelong learning. Like and the I world is now moving, moving to that. So yeah. And knowledge is freely available. Mm. So, uh, like at one time, like professor's notes used to be the most valuable thing in the world, mm -hmm. but that's not anymore. Right. And it's easily available. But they want to connect with any opportunity with the real world, mm. any experiences which mm. can connect them with the real world. That's still not happening. Anymore.